Please be seated. As we begin our commencement proceedings, we want to take a moment to thank Grayson Go for singing the national anthem and the College of Marin Symphonic Band in the direction of Dr. Trevor Gordon. Family, friends, graduates, alumni, and honored guests, on behalf of the entire College of Marin community, I extend to you all a warm welcome to the 89th Annual Commencement Ceremony honoring this graduating class of 2016. My name is David Graham Coon, and I'm honored to serve as the Superintendent President of the College. It is my pleasure to introduce an important group of individuals, the members of the Marin Community College District's Board of Trustees. Please stand as I call your name. Brady Bevis, Diana Conti, Dr. Eva Long, Stephanie O'Brien, Stuart Tannenberg, Wandine Trainer, and Oldina Alatriste, student trustee. Thank you, trustees, for the many hours you spent supporting the mission of the College of Marine. I would now like to introduce the other special guests seated before you. Please hold your applause until all have been introduced. Would you please stand and remain standing when your name is called? Jonathan Eldridge, Senior Vice President for Student Learning and Student Services. Greg Nelson, Vice President of Finance and College Operations. Sarah McKinnon, Academic Senate President. Monica Rudolph, Classified Senate Vice President. And Patrick McDurney Nikolai, ASCOM President. I thank each of you for your continued support and for your ongoing commitment to the success of our students. Many people have worked very hard in preparation for this evening's ceremony. I would like to draw your attention to the names on page 22 of your program. Let's take a moment to recognize the members of the commencement committee, led by Sadika Suleiman Hara, Director of Student Activities and Advocacy. Let's acknowledge our commencement committee. As we begin our commencement exercises, I would like to first acknowledge the faculty, staff, and administrators who are retiring with a combined total of 205 years of service to the college. 205 years. You can find their names on page 21 in the commencement program. I would like to ask those that are here with us this evening to stand and be recognized. And on behalf of the thousands of students whose lives you have touched, we thank you. So if you're retiring this year, please stand and be acknowledged. A bit about the class of 2016. These graduates are among the approximately 350 students who will receive 425 degrees and certificates this year. To break it down further, we will be awarding 164 associate in arts degrees, 65 associate in transfer degrees, 77 associate in science degrees, 38 associate in science transfer degrees, and 81 certificates of achievements. And of course, some students earn more than one degree or certificate. In addition, there are approximately 400 students who will transfer to a four-year college or university, recognizing that all, not all students who transfer earn a degree. And finally, the youngest of our graduates is 19 years of age, and our most experienced graduate is 66 years younger. Is Victoria DeWitt, our most experienced graduate among us this evening? Is Victoria here this evening? Oh, okay. Well, let's go ahead and acknowledge Victoria. She's earning an Associate of Arts degree in French. Congratulations, Victoria. While we are here this evening to celebrate the achievements of these great graduates, we also know that most achievements are not accomplished alone. All of you here, parents, spouses, partners, children, other family members, friends, and mentors, have played a significant role in our graduates' success. I join this graduating class in extending to you a heartfelt note of thanks. Graduates, please stand if you're able. Let's face all these tremendous support of yours, your greatest fans, and let's give them a round of applause. I also want to recognize 
recognize our faculty, staff, and administration. I join this graduating class in congratulating and thanking you for ensuring their interests and needs were your number one priority. You've done an outstanding job of delivering a high quality of education. These graduates here today and the many other students who will be transferred are a reflection of your incredible work. I particularly want to thank and express gratitude to the faculty. Over 60 of them have been here less than five years. And for some, this is their first commencement with us. So I'd like to take a moment and ask those faculty who are completing their first full-time year at College of Rand to please, please stand and be recognized. On the other end of the spectrum, we have faculty who have been with the college for many years. The faculty's passion for teaching and compassion for our students is evidence. Students this evening, I assure you, they are proud of your accomplishments. Faculty, staff, and administration, please stand so that we may acknowledge your many efforts and contributions. It's my pleasure to extend sincere congratulations to each of you. We are here today to applaud your accomplishments. While you may have had help and support along the way, you have reached this point through your own hard work. You pursued your dream, you made the commitment, and you made the sacrifices. It was through your grit and determination that you attained your goal. And for that, we applaud you. Congratulations. speaker is selected via a panel of faculty, staff, and students. And every year we have some amazing candidates this year. The person I'm about to introduce is probably pretty well known to a lot of students on campus and a fair number of the faculty. And I, I have to say that I did not know Atu Houston very well. Uh, and I wasn't sure how I was going to introduce him. But then I attended the EOPS uh, ceremony last week. And guess who was the featured speaker? was at to Houston. Then the next night I attended the transfer reception, and guess who was the featured speaker? It was at to Houston. So all I can say tonight to Dr. Q is you have a very tough act to follow. Uh, because having heard Atu's story uh, and having heard him speak uh, a couple of times in the last week, I can tell you uh, that his story is an amazing one. Atu began his journey in higher education in the spring of 2005, but due to illness, very serious illness, which he may mention in his remarks, he had to place his educational career on hold until 2012, when he returned to complete his education here at College of Marin. Atu has served as a tutor in speech and communication, and served as a student ambassador for EOPS and a leader in Tom's Transfer Club. He's going to be pursuing an education in media studies and will be transferring to UC Berkeley to obtain a BA. Now, Atu says he hopefully will continue on to achieve a master's degree, but I know that he will continue on to achieve a master's degree. And I think he probably will also then continue on to achieve his doctorate. His interest in mass media derived from wanting to dedicate and reinvent his life to becoming an advocate for those who cannot advocate for themselves. He wants to inspire those who are trying to see a brighter future. And I think everyone who knows Atu, and all of us after we hear his speech tonight, will agree that he is, in fact, a very inspiring human being. So it is my pleasure to present to you the 2016 student speaker, Atu Houston.
Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge a very special person in my life who has walked along beside me during most of my life's voyage, Kanisha Thompson. Thank you for your sacrifices and I love you. Let's begin. By definition, a mountain is a large elevation of the Earth's surface, rising abruptly from surrounding levels and areas. A steep hill. Life challenges and obstacles can be viewed as mountains. As mountains are natural, so are the lives of human beings. Furthermore, the abrupt rising from surrounding levels and areas are no different than the challenges and obstacles that come about during life's journey. As the mountain's face is large and steep, making the upward climb is also different. So the travel along life's path is often long, difficult, and at times disheartening. But at the summit of the mountain exists a pinnacle, a place of strength, a place of triumph, where victory can be celebrated. The battle to attain victory does not come easy. It must be earned. Because victory must be earned, one must be willing to overcome the mountains that exist in one's life. My life serves as a constant reminder of the perseverance and resolve that it takes to fight the trials of another day. I have faced many uncertainties, adversities, and transgressions that I have battled to overcome. Despite the death of dear loved ones and friends, being a veteran fighting PTSD, a partner five suffering complete loss, homelessness, financial concerns, surviving a 37-day coma, and becoming a heart transplant survivor, I have remained determined not to allow my life circumstances to restrict my pursuit of a brighter future. My passion for life has not been swelled, but has been amplified. Given an opportunity to obtain an education, I have utilized all the resources made available to reach the educational goal of transferring to a four-year college. Although the road to the goal has been filled with sufferings, it has been a fulfillment. I refuse to utilize my disadvantages to make excuses. Instead, I choose to overcome and gain a sure footing of life-building skills and academic success in hopes of others following in my footsteps regardless of their hardships. I am ecstatic to be here to celebrate this glorious day with each of you as we acknowledge the triumph of successful travel to one of life's pinnacles. Today's celebration marks the completion of gaining a degree and graduating. Yes, the mountain of reaching of our individual education and career goals come with invaluable sacrifices, resolve, and determination. For all of us being honored today, understand, we have earned and are deserving of the triumph of today because of the dedication and commitment we have all exhibited during our rigorous efforts of gaining an education with the hopes of achieving yet more out of life. In order to change the course of one's life for a brighter future in which to embark on and successfully navigate we must remain in this, as inspired as we are today, tomorrow. College of Marin serves as, and has served as, an institution of reinvention and renewed progressive thinking in order to capture out of life the desires and dreams of a fulfilled life. Today, the destination can be cherished, taken in with pride and be reflected upon as it pertains to applying what has been taught and learned 
so that we can contribute positively and become a valuable member of society and affect positive change. It is my deepest hopes that all of us here today understand the importance of gaining an education at College of Marin. For it provides us with endless amounts of support to ensure that our futures have no ceilings that cannot be reached, no barriers, no obstacles that cannot be successfully navigated past, nor overcome, so that we may move beyond and progress towards becoming a beacon of positivity and a vessel for powerful and impactful progress towards a tomorrow that is filled with every possibility and opportunity. Whereas our dreams are no longer dreams, but realities we can touch. Furthermore, the importance of gaining an education at College of Marine is that we are now equipped to enter society completely prepared to be the people we were always meant to be. People of strength and courage. People who are bold and brave. People with tremendous drive, will, determination, dedication commitment, perseverance, and resolve to do what is necessary to, in order to strive for and achieve successful outcomes. People with the passion to advocate for those that need and desire a voice of their own. People who care fervently for enhancing social relationships, for all, to bring truth to our great nation's notion of the truth, justice, opportunity, second chances, and liberty for all. These are the qualities in which make gaining an education at College of Marine significant. The education that we have earned at College of Marine has opened various avenues of obtainable future educational and career goals. In reference to the doors College of Marine opens for students, it is my pleasure to inform you that I will be attending the University of California Berkeley as a master of music. In addition, the confidence gained through the education provided by the excellent and brilliant professors and staff of the College of Marine, we can now boldly step out and use our minds for the improvement of our society. Instructors and staff such as Bonnie Bornstein, Patty O'Keefe, John Sutherland, Noel Robinson, Frank Crosby, Walter Turner, Jessica Porter, Adam Wayans, Ingrid Kelly, Abby Clean, Lisa D.S. Stanley, Paul Chaney, Steve New, Tony Johnson, and my math instructor John Jacobs and <laughs> Professor Costerico. Uh, Along with staff members such as Becky Reeves, Rose Thompson, Renetta Early, Oscana Pence, Addison, Javier, and Hugo of EOPS, the Umoja program, which is the big support, Vicky and Sadiqa of Ascom, the librarians David and John, and, and Ryan of the Writer Center, along with a host of others I can spend the rest of the night naming. <laughs> Inviting the safekeeping of the passing along of vital information for the future use of creating lasting social relationships with all ethnicities and all backgrounds. They teach us how to be leaders, not with words, but by example. Above all, the instructors and staff have enhanced our awareness of the level of attention that must be placed on the value of all human life and their well-being. For without the united people, there can be no universal wealth. The instructors provide each student with self-belief to be someone that they were always meant to be. Not only meant to be, but somebody who can make the difference, and be the difference, today and forever, it is my hope that I am speaking for all the students that are being honored here today that we will proudly represent College of Marin and remain proud products of, it, of its professors and staff. Be the best you, you can be. In closing, 
Graduation does not signify the end of our journey, but the beginning of a bright future. A future filled with many successes, on with the assurance that nothing can keep us from achieving what we set out to achieve. There are no ceilings, but there exist no heights that we cannot reach. Today is the proof, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we can achieve what we wish if we apply ourselves with a never give up or give in attitude. Again, it was a pleasure and an honor speaking to all of you in attendance, family and friends. And thank you for listening and being a special addition to today's ceremony. And congratulations again to the graduating class of 2016.
Besides being a constant, uh, constantly in demand lecturer on an array of subjects, Dr. Q continues to galvanize public attention. On the award winning ABC series Hopkins, his was the lead episode. Along with appearances on such shows as Nova, CNN with Sanjay Gupta, C uh, CBS News with Katie Couric, NBC's The Today Show, and as well as on National Public Radio, Dr. Q has been featured in a variety of newspapers and magazines and has a growing online following. Dr. Q is regularly listed as one of the best doctors in America and America's top surgeon as well as Baltimore top docs. Most recently, he was awarded the Cortez the Cadiz Prize for, in the category of surgery by the City Council of Cadiz, Spain, and was also named by Forbes as one of the most, one of the most creative Mexicans. Dr. Quinones currently lives in Hartford County, Maryland, with his wife, Anna, and their three children. Dr. Q.
of making something much more special and making being part of something much greater. I will tell you a story about an upcoming book that I have that I hope it resonates with some of your dreams and fears as I try to bring you to what I do and I try to share with you some of the experiences. I hope that some of the fears as well that I have had also as a scientist and as a brain surgeon. How little did I know that that kid that was working in the field when I was 19 years old in 1987, one day was going to be in the afternoon room in the laboratory, engineering the stem cells that I get from my own patients. Fat and I engineer with nanoparticles and I go ahead and put them back in animal models and I have three federal grants through the NIH to go ahead and do all these multi-million dollar studies. And I'm still the same crazy kid. Except that I have less hair back then, I had more hair and earrings in his side. You know, I tell you a story about earrings. I was actually doing one of my niches, so I have a foundation of going to do some very complex surgery around the world. And in 2011, I brought my daughter, who at the time was about 13, all right? And uh, I wanted her to see what I do as a brain surgeon, and I wanted her to be part of something where you get to help people that have much less than we do. And here I am in my chair operating in this small hospital in Mexico, in Guadalajara, and I have a team of about five brain surgeons, the most famous brain surgeons in the world who happen to be my friends. And I pay them nothing. They get in an airplane, they pay their own way there. And once we do all this surgery, we work for about 20 hours a day for about four or five days. Then after that, I give them a lot of tequila. That's how we celebrate them. <laughs> so here I am with my daughter. She's paying attention. I'm operating like I'm just taking this tumor out, this mantle in the face, eyes down, face down, brain exposed. And I'm taking this tumor. I'm under the microscope, mouthpiece, controlling with my, both of my hands, both of my feet. And I notice that she's paying attention. And I'm like, I made it. My own teenage daughter is paying attention to what I'm doing. <laughs> and then she goes, Dad, she gets really close. Do you have earrings in college? She was actually looking at my ears. That's when she first realized that at one point I was also, I had earrings. Let me take you to the OR. I peeled back the thin layer of a white pearl-like tissue covering the brain and see this large mass. My objective is to disconnect it from the brain, leave Chris intact and bring him back to his wife and children. I was worried, but I told my resident, a very large and dangerous tumor, and we need to get in and out with no collateral damage. As if I was reassuring myself that everything was gonna go well. I begin to slowly but steadily take out the small arteries that are keeping this mammoth alive. I can see and feel the possessions of the brain as it dances with the heart. I appreciate the brain with all the majestic grooves and the delicate texture. And I heard one of the residents quietly telling a Hopkins medical student that part of the brain contains the identity of this patient. Talking about identity, who's, led, who's read Game of Thrones? I see some hands. I read it because I got to keep up with my teenage kids. George R. R. Martin said about identity, never forget what you are, for surely the world would not. Make it your strength, then it can never be your weakness. Armor yourself in it, and it will never be used to hurt you. That's certainly a lesson that I have learned through the years of being here in the United States. I have to learn how to be proud of who I was as I was going through my journey from migrant farm worker, illegally at first, going now through community college, eventually to Houston work. I was there when the naked man was walking around naked. <laughs> there are no pictures of me running around naked, so we're good. You know, but I was there. Andrew Martinez was his name. You know, and it was an amazing time. You gotta have a great time, by the way. By the way, out of life. It's gonna be amazing this time of birthday. So, here I am. I continue to detach the tumor, and in the background, I hear the anesthesia machine beeping and giving me the sense that all was gonna go well. I thought I was gonna pull out what is called in my book, the Kaliman Maneuver. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Kaliman. Kaliman was a superhero in Mexico when I was growing up. He was a, he was a man who had no powers, unlike our Superman or Batman in the United States. This was a man who was a philanthropist who loved 
people who dedicated his life. And somehow he was extraordinarily wealthy, philanthropic, and he was educated. He knew many languages, religions. He traveled around the world. And through this little magazine that would come out every Thursday at 12 noon, and he cast a peso. And I didn't have a peso, so I had to get together with my friend Martin, Eduardo, and Gerardo. The four of us, 25 cents each, we buy with this magazine, and we pass it around. And I learned about the world through this superhero. This superhero has ama had amazing powers. One time, he was attacked by four foes, two in the front and two in the back. He used to jump like a gazelle, hit two with the fist and two with the feet. So here I am, walking around with my brother. We were, we were being bullied by these kids who were hitting us with BB guns. So I was tired, so I told my brother and my three cousins, I said, guys, I am going to practice the Kaliman kick. <laughs> my brother says, you're going to hurt us. I said, relax. I'm only going to tap you. I'm not going to hit you. So here I am. I'm about five years old. I jump up in the air. Boom. Landed on my belly. Crying. Completely out of air. Didn't hit anybody. I turn around and I see these four kids' faces looking down and completely. I mean, they were mummified. And suddenly they start bursting in laughter. I start crying. I go home. I tell my mom. My mom says, what's wrong with you? My mom was young, she was only about 23 at the time. And I said, Mom, today is a very disappointing day for me. I realized that Kaliman cannot be true. This was this little five-year-old kid who was so arrogant. I said, if I cannot do the Kaliman move, certainly Kaliman is not true. So here I am. <laughs> but that was true. I have the feeling, going back to the war, that the brain is dancing with the heart, and I hear the faint, soothing sounds of classical Spanish guitar in the background. The tumor is red and hard and the snake-like artery is coming out almost like a medusa. Suddenly there is a burst, a release beneath my fingers, and a river of blood under the microscope. Not knowing exactly where this was going and who was coming from, I asked, is the blood pressure normal? I asked Dr. Johnson, a physiologist, and he said, yes. Is the brain signal all right? And Jenny says, yes, no changes to the brain signals. I try to keep my calm demeanor but my heart is racing 160 beats per minute. I could feel the thumping in my heart. My adrenaline spiked. It was fight or flight. The man on the table, the life in my hands is Chris. I met him, his wife Bernadette, and their two beautiful daughters at the ages of one and three in July of 2011. Chris was sent to me by Dr. Reggie Davis, who was the only second African-American to be trained at Johns Hopkins as a brain surgeon, the, third, the first one being Ben Carson. Here comes a flashback. My phone ring, I picked up. Alfredo, Reggie says. To me, that, that's the way he's out. With a deep, resonant, very white light voice. I need you to see my dear patient with a dangerous tune. His voice warns me like that warns me your ears like the voice of Mustafa in the 1994 movie The Lion King. <laughs> but amidst that war, I sense a tone of urgency that peeks its head out when an experienced surgeon like Reggie, who had been practicing for about 30 years, is faced with an exceptionally challenging case. Chris showed up in my office shortly after the phone call and I welcomed him, his wife Bernadette, and his two daughters. The girls were really playful and Bernadette was really concerned. And she was trying to calm him down. I said, relax, I have three kids of my own and I learned how to multitask, so if they don't bother you, I'm okay with it. So that calmed him down a little bit. I saw the brain picture. The tumor was massive, vascular, in the most eloquent part of the brain, going from the left motor cortex all the way down to the brain stem and the medulla. This is what we call no man's land, tiger territory, is better known. When you go in to remove a tumor in that part of the brain, it's like diffusing a ticking bomb. Who saw the movie The Hurt Life that got an Academy Award, like around 2008? Jeremy Renner, who's one of my favorite characters in this movie, is being asked, are you within 100 meters of the IED? And he responds, hell, I don't know. I tell you when I'm on top of it, on top of it. And just like that, I go back to the upper room. I am on top of this IED, but I don't realize until it suddenly explodes right before my eyes. The beeping increases, the nurses begin to move. Dr. John's anesthesiology is quietly, but suddenly asking for more blood. We're losing about four liters of blood. The brain monitoring team whispers that the brain function is beginning to slow down dangerously. So we are at risk of losing increase. My skin is clammy, my scrubs are sticking to me, the room is getting extraordinarily hot. I 
doubted myself. At that point, I didn't know if I was going to get Chris alive out of this situation. My left foot is controlling the zoom in and out of the microscope. My right, my right foot is controlling the bipolar devices like welding machine. And I'm trying to, and I'm controlling the microscope with my mouth. And everything is bleeding. I just can't see anything. My hands are moving as fast as I can with the instrument. As I try to keep calm, I'm using all four controls and a joystick in the microscope without letting go. The machine keeps beeping, and I steady my hands leaning on the arm supports of this astronaut chair in which I actually used to do surgery. Under the microscope, the blood intensifies, and at times the red becomes so intense that it is difficult to see anything. If I disconnect the wrong artery, I can either leave Chris unable to speak or move his arms and legs, I thought to myself. As I was working and trying not to give up on Chris, I thought of his, patient, of his parents and how they just had lost two of their other children in recent years. The blood fades in my focus. I see the faces of Bernadette and her a girls laughing. Bernadette's last words are, as she is walking and as Chris is going into the operating room, she tells him and tells, she gives him a nice tender kiss and tells me, please bring him back safe for his girls. The tears trickle from her eyes as she gave Chris a tender kiss in the lips. How can I disconnect these wires, I asked myself, as this bomb is speaking in front of me without leaving him devastated? His life was escaping in front of me. The beeping, the beeping of the machine is blaring more intense than before, assaulting my ears. Chris' heart rate is extraordinarily high. It's much higher than mine. It's about 180 beats per minute. We are in danger of his heart giving up any second. I know about giving up. I lean forward and I said to him, please, Chris, don't give up on me. I go back and I remember April 14, 1989, when I myself surrendered my life in the bottom of a liquefied petroleum gas tanker of about 35,000 gallons. And I tried to save my own life to the point that I left it all on the table. But my father and my brother-in-law Raymond didn't give up on me and they went back not once, but twice they risked their own life to save mine. Now this event is being put in the big screen by Plan B. Yes, the producers of Toyos, Slave, Selma, and most recently the Big Shore in, con in conjunction with Disney, they're making a big screen movie of this odyssey of this poor boy who came to this country with nothing and now walks the hallways of some of the greatest institutions in the land. And he went to community college too. We last about four liters of blood in about five minutes. Dr. John says to me, disheartened, but is still reassuring me that he had my back, and most importantly, he had Chris's back. You never work in isolation, you have a team. I have um, uh, accumulated a team of about 30 people that surround me every single time that I do one brain surgeon. By now, I've done about 2,500 over the last 10 years. We are losing the electrical signals, Jenny tells me trying not to panic, but with a tremble in her voice. Chris, I said, please trust me, I'm out of leaning my head towards him. Don't let go, hold on. Nino Rota's guitar in the soundtrack to The Godfather was playing something in the background. What will happen? It took me 20 years to understand that sometimes the answers for questions, such as the one that I'm asking as to what's gonna happen when we fall down, the answers tend to be rather simple. And sometimes they are right in front of us, and we don't even know. I will share with the graduates three simple principles that have guided my own life as I attempted to make sense of my own journey, trials and tribulations, the times that I have fallen, I have gotten up again, and I have tried to get up again. And what happens when you're facing those moments where you doubt yourself? Number one, be passionate in your ambition for life. Number two, be pointed in your approach to life. Number three, be purposeful in your aim in life. Back in my younger years, I could have used the guidance of Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. Yes, I read them too. When he said, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I see a smile, he read it. 
For Chris, I doubted myself for a moment, but something inside me allowed me to find that, to find that still in my soul and fight for him. Six months later, after this amazing event where he almost lost his life, in this near-death experience for Chris, he actually ran a half marathon with me. And he actually crossed the finish line before I even waited for me so we can actually cross it together. With a big smile as Bernadette and the girls welcomed me. That was the greatest gift that I could have ever received. And for that, I was grateful to God and I was grateful to all the people that worked with me that day to save his life. Am I the man? You, you judge right now. Listen to this experience. Um, this is a beautiful fall day, September, October, in Baltimore, up in Hartford County. Horse County, beautiful. The leaves are falling. I go with my son David. He's about five, six years old. He's in his tricycle. He's 14 now. I said to David, son, you are the man. He looks up in his little tricycle and says, Dad, I'm not the man. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to teach my son a lesson. Son, I just want you to believe in yourself. He tries to a little bit more. He looks up and says to me, Dad, I do believe in myself. I just know I'm not the man. At age five or six, he was teaching me a lesson about humility. So I'm not the man. I know that for sure. God bless you. God bless America. And congratulations for your Moment. 
momentarily. We will present you with your degrees, but first, a musical selection. Thank you. 